believe that the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their savior. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I believe there is a heaven and a hell and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. Hello church. Westside Family in Kansas City is one church in three locations, Lenexa Speedway and Leavenworth. It is my privilege today to be in Leavenworth to speak to the congregation there. And you have the great privilege of having Casey Robinson, who is the campus pastor at Westside Family in Leavenworth. He is an awesome speaker. He is going to bring the house down. And when he comes up, I want to encourage you to give him a round of applause. But before he comes up, I have a very special treat for you. Since we started the Believe Journey now 10 weeks ago, uh, you have doubled your consistency in your attendance. That means you're here more. And when you're here more, like I told you, we can do a lot more with you. And I want to show you the fruit of that today. You're going to really enjoy it. We'll see you next week. Brody, who is God? I believe that the, that the God of the Bible is the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the love that God has given us be with you. Very good. Does God care about me? I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Psalms 121-2. My help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. Very good. How do I have a relationship with God? I believe a person can have a relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2-8. God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Very good. How do I know God has a plan for my life? I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and has the right to guide my beliefs and actions. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Nice, Simon, nice. Who am I? I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. John 1, 12 says, yet to all who did relieve him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yes, he did. How will God accomplish his plan? I believe God ac accomplishes his plan by the church. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15 says we will speak the truth in love by so the truth in love so we will grow up in every way to become the body of Christ. Very, very good. How does God see us, Kyra? I believe all people are made by God and need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Awesome. What should we do about people who are in need? I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to those in need. Psalm 82, three and four, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the poor and the needy, Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Very good. What is God's call on my life? I believe everything I am and everything I own belong to God. The earth belongs to the Lord and so does everything in it. Psalms 24, 1. What happens next? I believe there is a heaven and a hell and that Jesus will return to establish his internal kingdom. John 1, 1 through 2. I Do not let your hearts be troubled for there are many rooms in my father's house. Awesome, give it up for these kids, that's awesome. And while you are applauding, let's give it up for Casey Robinson from Leavenworth. Oh, it's so good to see you all today. Uh, it's amazing to all of you that are memorizing not just the key truths, but also the key scriptures that are going along as we are in this Believe journey. And today we get to land the plane on this first leg of this Believe journey as we ask a key question that is critical, critical to everything. In fact, this key question is critical for two reasons, at least two reasons for me. One is that I know one of these things about that key question is it's going to define some of the most important decisions you ever make that this key question we're gonna look at today is going to do that. The second thing about this is this key question could lead you to the life that God originally created you and designed you to 
experience. And that question is this right here. What happens next? Write that in your notes. If you got your notes, pull those out and write that in. What happens next? And before we get into this, as we look into this, I wanna offer a, a shout out to all of those that are watching over in the South Sanctuary, as well to those that are all of our guests here and over there, as well as those who are watching online, especially Arman and Dubai and Jeff Nelson, who I can't make this up, is trucking right now through Santa Claus, Indiana, on his way back home to Olathe. Let's give all of our guests and those watching online and over there in the South Sanctuary a big hand. <laughs> Today, as we ask this question, what happens next? This is a very challenging question. And, and we're not talking about next, what, like what happens next after this guy gets done talking and whether we're going to eat Mexican or barbecue after this. It's not a matter of that next. This is really a question that, that we're asking is, what happens after we die? What happens to you and I after we die? Now, here's what I know is, is you likely have a belief about what happens next. As many of you have a belief about what happens next to you. And, and in this, maybe you feel like or you believe that you're gonna get up to the pearly gates and St. Peter's gonna be there, but you might believe that he's gonna tell you the joke this time. <laughs> or you're gonna get to heaven and when you get to heaven, you can't wait to get to heaven because you've got a lot of unanswered questions that you're gonna ask God and you're looking forward to that moment that you're just gonna be able to sit with him and ask all of those questions. Speaking of that, my daughter, who's six years old, I was helping her clean her room this past week. And um, as we were working in her room, she looks at this beautiful rainbow that my wife painted on her wall, and she just goes, oh, why is pink not in the rainbow? <laughs> just gives you a little picture into our life. And I look at her, I go, Genesis, you know what? That's a great question that I think you should ask God when you get to heaven. He would love to answer that question. Now, regardless of what you believe about what happens next after you die, I believe this is in all of our thoughts, that there is a next, there's an, there's an eternity that is connected to that next. See, you likely have a belief about what happens next, and most likely that includes an idea of eternity. See, I believe most people believe in or question eternity because of this. Eternity is part of our humanity. See, eternity, I believe, is part of your humanity. It, 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 it was put into your DNA. Look what, look what it says right here in this, this idea that the wisest man who ever lived says this about this. He goes, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He made you beautiful in his time. He made the person next to you beautiful in his time. He also, he informs us, has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Now, I want you to know, see, he, the wisest man said, we can't even fathom what God has done within this span of time that you and I have been given within eternity. So it's gonna be hard for us to wrap our minds around what eternity really is, but today, I wanna lead you and hopefully help you discover what Jesus talks about and wants you to discover that eternity is. And today we're going to look at that. And, and I believe that eternity has been a part of our humanity and it's because God has created eternity in us. And when we see that eternity is in us, what it does in us is I believe that it does something, it evokes something out of us. And I believe it brings hope into our lives and evokes hope out of our lives. See, this hope in eternity has led people throughout many generations to write songs Many generations to put a voice for a culture. And I grew up in a church culture. And there's been a, ho a hopeful voice that has been a part of the church culture. Actually, since Jesus came to this earth, lived, died, and came back to life. See, there's been this hopeful expectation of eternity. And some people have written songs like, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory, or what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. See, I grew up in church. I know those songs, and there's been voices that have, have pinned hope in eternity. But if you didn't grow up in church, maybe you connect with the song like, like building a stairway to heaven. <laughs> or knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. 
See, I believe that eternity is a part of what you think about when you think about what happens next. See, I think the thought of heaven evokes something inside of us. And the reason I think that is because, and, and, and because you and I long and we hope for eternity. And the reason I believe is because we know that something isn't right here. Because if it were right, if it were right right now, we wouldn't long for, we wouldn't hope for what's next. Write this in your notes. See, write this in. We hope for eternity because sin has created suffering and death. Why is it that you hope for eternity? Why is it that there's this yearning, this longing inside of you that hopes for eternity? It's because sin, when our first parents chose to go their own way instead of choosing God's way, sin entered at that moment humanity's bloodline. And this left humanity cursed by sin with suffering and death. And as we've been exploring through these scriptures, as we've been on this belief journey, we've learned that Jesus has come to reverse the curse of sin. Jesus came to reverse a curse of sin that would invite pain into our relationships, that would invite suffering into our bodies, and that would ultimately invite death into all of humanity. And Jesus' message was a message of hope that would sustain us through the trouble we endure. See, this is what Jesus would talk about. In, in this one time of Jesus' time with his disciples, he gets his disciples together and he was constantly trying to prepare them for his exit. And in this one moment, he reminds them of something that he just didn't tell them about once. He said, hey, I'm gonna go away. You need to know I'm gonna go away. And, and where I'm going, you can't go with me. And his disciples were like, wait a second. You, you, what, what do you mean you're gonna go away? See, Jesus, you being here with us is the key to this whole thing that you've been talking about. You, you know, you being here, we want you to come and bring the kingdom that you've been talking about, restore everything that you've been talking about, and you're the key to this, so you can't leave us. You need to be here with us. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. See, I'm gonna go, but don't worry. I'm gonna go, and this is what he says to them, and I want you to look at this real quick. It's our key verse for today. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And like, and like in a world full of trouble, don't let your hearts be troubled. So do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be, and I want you to say this word with See, if I go, I want you to know this, Peter. If I go, it, it, Bartholomew, Andrew, and maybe you, if I go, I'm gonna go and prepare a place for you. It, uh, I will come back to, and I'm gonna take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. See, our hope is not in a where. Our hope is in a who we will be with. Jesus, at this moment in time, was using a metaphor, an interesting metaphor that you and I just don't get in today's day and age. See, we don't get this metaphor because in this day and age, when he talked about going to prepare a place for you, the disciples understood that Jesus was talking about a wedding. See, you and I don't get that. You know, you and I, we, we, don't, we don't get this because we live in a Western culture of today's age. But then, man, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because in that day and age, when a young man saw a young lady that caught his eye and he wanted to spend the rest of his life with, or they were betrothed to in marriage, in this moment, the son would visit the bride-to-be and talk with the parents. At that moment, the, son, the groom-to-be would then say to the bride-to-be and to the father and the mother of the bride saying, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna prepare a place so I can have her live with me. And he would then journey back to his parents' land, either build a home that was adjacent to their home or on the property of the father's land. And there he would build and he would work hard anticipating the moment that his father would say, hey, it looks great, go get your bride. 
And in the moment that his father realized that this is the time, your home is ready for your bride, he would release her, release him to go fetch his bride to be. See, in our context today, we don't get that because our kids don't really move back home. Well, maybe, if we're lucky. And while the groom was building his home, the bride was in her home, expecting, hoping that any day the groom-to-be would be released by the father to come back and fetch her so she could be with him. She would be preparing for her groom to come any day. She didn't know when. And instead of worrying, the bride would be hopeful, expecting her groom-to-be's arrival any day to take her to be with him. See, Jesus didn't want just his disciples to know about this, about his coming back, He wanted you to know about his return. He wanted you to put your hope in that one day he is going to come back and he's going to bring you to be with him. See, he wants you to know this so your hearts won't be troubled. Just like he didn't want the disciples' hearts to be troubled. That in a world full of trouble, you don't have to let your heart be troubled. He wants you to believe that he has a place for you, a place for you to be with him. See, being with Jesus is the most important and most meaningful thing that you and I can have in life because of this, because when you are with Jesus, you are with the source of life. Write this in. See, when I'm with Jesus, I'm with life. Life. This was the message of Jesus. This was the kingdom message that Jesus talked about. He referred to himself as being, in, being life. He would say, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He would say, I am the way, the truth, the life. He, he, would, he would say, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. Life more than what you could ever experience here on earth. I am the way to that life. And he would prove that he was the way, the truth. And the life. He would prove that he was the author of life with power over death. When Lazarus, a close friend of his, would die and, and Lazarus' sisters would be there worried and, and, and overwhelmed by the pain and suffering of death, Jesus was there to prove that he was the author and the source of life. And Jesus uses this opportunity to give them hope and, and, he, and to remind them that he was life. And this is what he says to the oldest sister, Martha. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. See, Jesus would prove this. He would prove those words to be true, that he had the authority over death as he would raise Lazarus back to life. And in this moment, we would understand that life always triumphs over death, that Jesus came to reverse the curse of sin. That's what Jesus came to do, to show us that he is the source of life. And when Jesus ultimately would defeat death through his own resurrection, he would, in this moment, anchor hope into all who put their trust in him as life. This is what anchored hope in these disciples. When Jesus would come back to life, when his resurrected body proved that he had the power and triumph over death, he defeats death, proving to his disciples that his life always triumphs over death, that he came to reverse the curse of sin. And it was this disciple's hope. See, look at this. It was the disciple's hope in Jesus being life which gave them the courage to face suffering and even death. It was the disciples' hope that Jesus was who he said he was. He was life. And that Jesus would do that what he said he would do. He would go and prepare a place and come back to get 
all who trust and believe in him so we can be with him forever. See, that hope, that hope is what gave the disciples the courage in, in, to, to face suffering and even death. Hope for a man named Thomas to face suffering and death in the moment of his death. Hope for a man, a disciple named Peter that would be in prison and not knowing what the next day would bring. And he would be at so much peace because he knew his hope was in Jesus that he was able to even sleep through the chaos of what that prison cell brought. See, when we believe that Jesus is life, when you and I understand that Jesus is life and it, and it moves as Randy's been talking about from our head to our heart, and when we believe what he says about what happens next, we won't worry about today's trouble. See, that's hope. That's a hope in eternity. And that hope inspired Paul to write these words. Read this with me. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we boast. <laughs> we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. To which I would say, wait a second, Paul. I don't think you understood what you just wrote there. You said we glory in our sufferings. I don't really do that. <laughs> but he would say, yeah, we glory in our sufferings. And let me show you why, Casey. We glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character. And I want you to see this in character. Say it, hope. hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, suffering produces a hope that when we endure it, it allows us to become more like Jesus. And this is because God's poured out his love into our hearts and he's with us through his Holy Spirit. You see, he goes on to write this, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while you and I was still in sin, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified, and that word justified just means just as if you would never sinned. Not because of your works and because of what you be behave and your behaviors, but because you believe in Jesus, you've received his spirit. And because of that, he, you've received what Jesus has done for you. And now we have been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See, the hope of salvation is what eternity is. It's a salvation from God's wrath through Jesus Christ. And God's wrath on sin is that, that he would leave us to our own selfish desires. And our own selfish desires and our own selfish way always leads to death. It always leads to death, which is the absence of life. Later, Paul would remind this church that he's writing to in Rome in his letter. And he would say, the wages of sin, don't forget this, the wages of sin, what sin earns you is death, but there's a gift that God wants to extend everyone. And that gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is life, and he is hope. He is the hope of our salvation from the curse of sin, which has, is, brings on the wrath of God. And in this, salvation, as we discovered in week three of our Believe journey, salvation is a gift to all who trust in Jesus as their savior and trust him enough to follow him as their Lord. See, the gift of God's love is poured into our hearts by God putting his spirit inside of us. See, when you put your trust in Jesus, when you place your trust in him, he places his spirit inside of you. 
And God becomes with you at that moment. And eternity (laughs) changes for you at the moment you put your trust in him. See, eternity changes at that moment. We have the hope of salvation because God is with us. A love that God gives you and I enough. He loves us enough that he wants to be with you now by putting his spirit inside of all who put their trust in him. See, he wants us to experience salvation now so that no matter what we go through and no matter what you experience in life, you can have that hope of salvation no matter what you go through and you can have the hope of eternity even now. The hope that God is with you and you are with God. See, being with Jesus forever is the hope of our salvation because to have Jesus is to have life. See, you're with the source of life. And to have Jesus is to have life. And life, life was this message that Jesus constantly preached about. It was who he was. See, life is who Jesus is. And life is what heaven is. See, this is what heaven is. Heaven is life with God. You want to know what heaven's going to be like? It's going to be better than the best moment of life you've had now. That moment that you wish could never go away. Heaven's going to be so much better than that because you're going to be with the source, the giver of life forever. You'll never be separated from that. When you put your trust in Jesus, you inherit heaven as life with God. It's going to be the best life ever. It's going to be the fullest life ever. And God's kingdom is for all. God's kingdom of life forever is for all, for all who place their trust in Jesus and have God with them. It's God's original design that has been, that that we see in, in the Genesis story that humanity was with God uninterrupted by sin. And God is working a plan to restore all things and all who will trust in him back into that relationship with him. See, eternity is those with God that will experience truly what life is. And that's heaven with God. And Jesus reveals to John, who gave us this earlier, this early, earlier, our key verse for today. And Jesus reveals to John and includes heaven, but he he talks about heaven and then he talks about something even better than that. See, it's not just where you're gonna be because there's there's another thing about heaven, about eternity that's just as powerful. See, it's not just heaven. It's that God's gonna recreate the earth and we're gonna reign with him forever on the earth. And this is what he shows John in a vision. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. See, this is eternity. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I wonder if this moment that John was reminded and remembering the moment that Jesus said, I'm gonna go to prepare a place for you. And in this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. See, he will dwell with them. And then what's this gonna look like? They will be his people and God himself will be with them them and they be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the order, the old order of things has passed away. See, in eternity, for those who are with God, there's no more death because you're connected to life forever. In eternity, there's no more pain because you're connected to life. There's no more suffering because you're connected to life. For all who place their trust in Jesus, you'll never be disconnected from life because life always triumphs over death. And those who don't trust in Jesus, those who don't receive his life will eternally be disconnected from God, the source of life. And to be disconnected with From God is to be without life and to experience death. And that's what hell is. See, hell is this, write this in. See, hell is without God and therefore without 
life. Hell is the absence of God. It's the absence of life, a place of suffering and death, a place that Jesus would constantly and, and, and multiple times warn his people about, a place where the pain and suffering would be so great that being disconnected from the, the life and, and the people that you love and being disconnected from that life, would he, Jesus would warn would be like a pain that would cause people to wail and gnash their teeth. See, hell is a real place, and that real place is an eternity without God. Be because those people rejected God's way to life and therefore have been disconnected from life itself. So what do we learn about what's next? Yes, there is a heaven a place for those who have put their trust in Jesus so that all who put their trust in Jesus and believe in him will one day be with God, the source of life forever. And yes, there is a hell for those who have rejected God's way by thinking that they can live life their way and the way that they want. And that's a place where you'll experience life without God, be disconnected from life. And we also believe that Jesus will return. He will come back and he will restore his kingdom for eternity. And this is our key truth for today as we look at this. I want you to read it with me. I believe there is a heaven and a hell and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. See, the hope of eternity is you with God and with the family of God forever. That, that is heaven. That is what we hope for in the midst of the suffering and the pain to be with God, the source of all life, and to be with all of those who have put their trust in Jesus. There's a book I'm reading with some friends of mine that's called Everybody Always, and Bob Goff is this lawyer who is a Christ follower, and he's a fun read. And he writes this, and I just wanna read this to you in closing. I think he captures it all. He says, God demonstrated the word with is much bigger and worthier and more accessible than any 10 Bible verses. It also doesn't rhyme with anything, which is a plus. It doesn't sound like a big theological statement because it's not. It's a huge theological statement. It's God's purpose for us. It's the reason Jesus came. It's the whole word in a Bible, in the Bible. It's the whole Bible in a word, with, with. So my question for you as we close today is will you be with Jesus when you die? I want you to write that in. See, you need to ask this. Do you trust that you will be with Jesus when you die? That when this life is over, you will be with him? And if your trust is in Jesus, if you're believing in Jesus, then the words, the promise that Jesus says that he proved through his resurrection is true, is that we who believe in him will live forever. And it's not just an intellectual knowledge. It's a trust in this. And if we trust in this, we will be with him forever. You know what that means for you? That no matter what you go through in this life, you can have the courage to go through it because the hope of eternity and the hope of salvation is that you're gonna be with God and you're gonna be with his people, his family, all who have trusted in Jesus forever. See, that's the hope of eternity. And for those of you that say, Casey, I don't know if that's true for me. I wanna give you a quick opportunity to invite you into a relationship with Jesus because that's what it's all about. It's trusting in Jesus. And the, ba the basis, the foundation of any relationship is trust. And this is what Jesus wants to have with you is a relationship with you by you trusting in him. Trusting that he lived the perfect life that you can never live. That it's not by your works, that you're, that, that you're made right with God by his perfect life that he wants to offer to you. And it's through his death that it pays for all those sins and all those regrets that you wish you never have in your record, but he wipes it clean through his death. And it's trusting that he is alive, proving that he is resurrection and he is life and that your hope is in that he will one day return to bring you to be with him and all who trust in him forever.
And if that's you today, I would love to pray with you. And as I pray, let this be your voice and you can put your trust in Jesus. You can say, Jesus, that's me. I wanna put my trust in you today. Can we all bow our heads? Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this earth to live the life that we could never live on our own so we could be right with you. Thank you for allowing your life to be a gift to us. Thank you for dying on a cross so we could be made right with you. Thank you for taking the penalty upon, of our sins upon yourself. God, we trust in you. We trust in your life. We trust in your death. And we trust that you are alive again, proving that you are God and that you are the way to life. And we trust that you're going to give us life as we put our trust in you. And thank you for putting your life in us by putting your spirit inside of us. We trust that today. And thank you that now because our trust is in you, we have a hope that can endure anything, no matter what we go through in this life. And that hope is a hope of our salvation, a hope in an eternity with you. Thank you for our life in you, Jesus, in your name, amen. God bless you, Westside, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.